I speak in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Please be seated. Good morning. What is it we want when we can't stop wanting? What is it we want when we can't stop wanting? And how do we make that hunger productive and vital rather than corrosive and destructive? These are the questions that animate Christian Wyman as he explores the relationships between art and faith death and fame, heaven and oblivion, in his book, he held radical light, the art of faith, the faith of art. According to Jesus, hunger for bread represents a deeper spiritual hunger. It is a theme of an exchange between Jesus and a crowd of hungry people who have been following him for days. The crowd that follows Jesus is described as relentless, determined, and driven. They are not about to be distracted or discouraged because their hunger is deep and palpable. Today's gospel is a part of a larger, defining narrative. Jesus miraculously transforming five loaves of bread and two fish into abundance so generous that it feeds 5,000 people with 12 baskets left over. Then he appears walking on water to his terrified disciples in a small boat in a raging storm. The crowd closely watches Jesus' every move. They have followed him across the sea not because of the signs they have experienced, but because of the bread. They ate the bread to satisfaction, and now they want more. The bread that filled their stomachs now becomes the primary extended metaphor Jesus uses to stretch their understanding. This bread of life discourse in the Gospel of John takes over the entire month of August in our Gospel readings. So don't be alarmed when you feel extra hungry after these services in this month. There will be a lot of talk about bread. Although the bread metaphor is crucial, it is important to remind ourselves that this is not where we need to go. The whole of the bread metaphor needs to be held in relationship with other important conversations. This conversation about food do not work for the food that perishes, but for the food that endures for eternal life, which the Son of Man will give you, from verse 27. Talk about manna, our ancestors ate the manna in the wilderness, as it is written, he gave them bread from heaven to eat, from verses 31. And bread throughout provides an interesting parallel to chapter 4, when Jesus has this amazing, multi-leveled conversation about living water with a Samaritan woman at the well. Both includes a reference to ancestors. One talks about Moses, one talks about Jacob. Both include the identical command to Jesus, Lord, give me, sir, give me. Both share the desire for a permanent supply of bread and water so that I may never be hungry or I may never be thirsty. Just as the conversation with the woman at the well was about water, but was not. This conversation is about bread, but is not. Bread is the metaphor. Jesus continues to use this image that comes from the feeding miracle. Bread 
and fish is what fill their stomachs and they have become so focused on being full that they have lost what really happened. Jesus uses the bread as an extended metaphor for who he is. Someone capable of truly sustaining life. The Reverend Megan Murphy Gill, an author and an Episcopal priest, writes in her book, The Sacred Life of Bread, a spirituality of anything invites the adherent to experience transformation. A spirituality of bread should therefore demand a transformation not only in the individual, but also in how the individual related to the community and the community to itself. To develop a deep spirituality of bread requires an examination and transformation of the larger system of how bread comes to be. Jesus wanted those who followed him to discover real spiritual nourishment so that they would never hunger again and that they would lead a life worthy of the calling to which they have been called to build up the body of Christ. Letter to the Ephesians is telling us that those who are called to live into the fullness of life are to follow these virtues, humble, gentle, patient, loving, and coming together in unity. We are asked to lead a life worthy of the calling to which you have been called with all humility and gentleness with patience, bearing with one another in love, making every effort to maintain the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace. That's a lot. With humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, making every effort to maintain the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace. I don't know about you, but I know that there are days when I am able to live into two, maybe three of these virtues. As I, I come out of the subway station to come to work, I see a bunch of tourists standing on top of the stairs looking at their phones on which direction they should go. I lose my patience and gentleness. Not the proud New Yorker moment, if you will. But fortunately, we do not have to do this ourselves alone. There is one body and one spirit, just as you were called to the one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is above all and through all, and in all. You might recognize this as we say this together at the beginning of every baptism. Each of us was given grace according to the measure of Christ's gift so that some would be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers, some like Nathan's from our first reading who calls out sin and guide people in the path towards confession and restoration as we see in the life of King David. But all these gifts have one purpose. That is to equip the saints for the work of ministry, for building up the body of Christ until all of us come to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to maturity, to the measure of the full stature of Christ. In the beginning, I asked, what is it we want when we can't stop wanting? Perhaps what St. Augustine writes in his confessions could be an answer to this question. St. Augustine writes, 
You have made us for yourself, O Lord, and our hearts are restless until they rest in you. Restlessness is that desire to be filled and fulfilled. We all have it. And one of the things that defines us as humans, it is created in us by God. We should be restless. The restlessness of love is always an incentive to go towards the others. The restlessness of love makes us want to know each other better. The restlessness of love gives us the power of tolerance, understanding, and acceptance. We should be restless until all of us come to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to maturity, to the measure of the full stature of Christ. May our hearts be restless, restless for love, for justice, for peace and unity, until we can rest in God. Amen.